in our epistle reading today, uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 19 through 23, St. Paul uses a word in verse 23 that really kind of perplexed me at first. Let me read you verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages. Why use the word wages? Um, at first passage kind of puzzled me. Why not use just simply use the word punishment? Uh, the punishment of sin is death, or even penalty. The penalty of sin is dead. Now, according to Webster's, wages can be defined as the following. Wages, used with a singular or plural verb, recompense, or return. Now, as you know, in Webster's, what they always do is, is after a certain definition, they'll turn around, they'll put in, they'll use the word in an example. And I think y'all, I was delighted, and I think you'll be delighted to know in Webster's dictionary for uh, the example sentence uh, for this, or phrase, uh, for this definition, it was the wages of sin is death. Um, now, wages refers <coughs> to work, to labor. And the more I thought about it, the more I studied it and thought about it, the more it made sense to me. Now, we can all probably de uh, declare with conviction that we have, we do now, and probably will in the future work pretty hard. Um, life in this world is pretty hard work. And we can thank Adam for that. In the very beginning, Adam's original sin, he is punished not only by spiritual death, but also by hard labor. Here's Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the, vo unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And then in verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now the moment Adam sinned against God, he died spiritually. So in a sense, we are all being born of original sin. We too are born dead in sin. But God changes all that. Everything changed. God sent his only begotten son, our Savior Jesus, to suffer and to die for that original sin. For all those baptized before us, here in the present, and all those of the future, to the end of all things. Or to quote R.E.M., till the end of the world as we know it. Oh, and by the way, I need to make an announcement. I discovered this. I've been told this. Uh, the end of the world as we know it actually is going to happen next month, the 21st to be exact, at 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, the sky will turn black, it will rain fish, pigs will fly, and politicians will actually tell the truth. <laughs> but um, now the solar eclipse is going to be an amazing day. And I know I digress, but uh, eclipse mania is kind of descending on us and it's coming quick like a locust swarm. Uh, gird yourself. It's going to be crazy. Um, now St. Paul points out the magnitude of God's sacrifice in the same chapter 6. I mean, yes, yeah, same chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve <clears throat> sin. In that sacrifice, God gave us a do-over, a mulligan. We are freed from sin, given a new life. So now, we, through our own free will, we have to work, we have to labor for our own spiritual death through sin. St. James, chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I sat there and when I was writing this, I kind of stopped and started reflecting um, and about my own sinful past and how hard I'd work for it. Obviously, when it comes to working for sin, I work cheap. But, <laughs> um, now, I was searching the internet and I was looking for quotes about work and I came across a list of idioms related to work. Now, there are a boatload of them, but here are just a few of them. We all work our fingers to the bone. Uh, we work all the hours God gives us. 
we put all our weight in it when we work. And once we fail, when we fail, we have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps or pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off. Now there's another one that I am pretty much the uh, poster child for. And to prove it, basically, Kathy keeps a shovel in every room in our house because inevitably I'm going to open my mouth and say something stupid. And unfortunately, I'm not smart enough to know when to shut it. So she just hands me a shovel so I can keep digging myself deeper and deeper and deeper. That is exactly what we do when we sin. We dig ourselves just a little, a little deeper each time we do it. The more we sin, the more we dig deeper and deeper, separating ourselves farther from God, killing ourselves a little by little, and even sometimes digging ourselves into a hole so dark and deep it hides from us the truth and the light. I had a friend tell me once that they were in that hole, the darkest, loneliest spot in their life. And God made them realize how they had allowed themselves to dig themselves into such a place. And this is a quote from them. They turned around and said to me that they had sat down and walked away from the gift of God's grace. They set down his gift, turned their backs on it, concentrating only on their own selfish desire, and they picked up a shovel instead. The gift of God's grace and eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a gift he can never, he will never take away. He won't move the goalpost on us. We don't have to work for it. It's always right here in our hands. We just have to keep a firm grip on it. And the easiest way to do that is with our love for Him, our worship for Him, our prayers of thanksgiving to Him. I mean, for example, even when we start our day, if we're sitting there laying in bed, we just got up, we just woke up, very simply say, good morning, God. I love you. Thanks for all that you have blessed me with and that you're going to bless me with this day. If we do that, we've already got a firm grip on that priceless gift when we get out of bed. And he even plans it, even when we do try to put it down, and we all do, we put it down. We try to turn our back on it. He moves it. It always ends up to get in our way, and, we try, and he has us trip over it. So we'll turn around, put the shovel down, and pick it back up. Let me read this statement to you. Statement is, the Bible is God's word written. The holy scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are divinely inspired and contain all things necessary to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the first and foremost of our beliefs as Orthodox Anglicans. And that is straight from the OAC website. God's written word is part of that gift. He gave it to us to live by. It's kind of like uh, an eternal blueprint of joy, comfort, strength, and courage. He gave it to us, so his gift is a little harder to put down. Makes it kind of sticky. It's like that piece of tape. You get stuck on your finger and you can't get it off. You try to pull it in and it still sticks. To put it down, you have to work for it. God's written word is not an evolving social construct designed to change with the winds of political correctness. God is not just a happy dragonfly, and Satan is not just a mythical boogeyman, and hell does exist, and it is far, far worse than the worst day we can imagine in this world. Now, for some of this generation, that even worse, the worst day they can imagine is a day without their phone and Facebook. <laughs> now, St. Paul is referring to both spiritual death and eternal death. <clears throat> God's written word is not meant to frighten us. It's not meant to enslave us. It is meant to strengthen our resolve against the powers that will never cease to try to destroy us through sin. I will conclude with this. This is the book of Revelations, chapter 20, verses 6 through 15. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. 
on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. May God's word and his gift of eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, live in our hearts today and every day. Amen. Amen. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.